As Chancellor of the State University of New York, the nation's largest comprehensive system of public higher education, Dr. Zimford drove regional and local economic development. Her work has involved the creation of seamless cradle-to-career education pipelines in several communities. Dr. Zimfer has also served as president of the University of Cincinnati, chancellor of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and executive dean of the professional colleges and dean of the College of Education at The Ohio State University. And she's really been an inspiration to us. So we're thrilled to have her with us. So I welcome Dr. Zimfer to the um, podium here. your leadership of Advance Illinois. Okay, so um, I'm thrilled to be back again with Advance Illinois. Uh, I did my homework. I was trying to read everything I could about 60 uh, by 25. Uh, I also work with a couple of uh, sites that are part of what's called the Strive Together uh, network, uh, which is a cradle to career network that started in Cincinnati, which uh, was where I served at the University of Cincinnati. Um, so I have sort of a story to tell, and I needed to tell it kind of starting where, where I am living and working in New York. And I thought you would uh, enjoy the fact that there's a word up there that uh, is largely unknown called systemness, um, which uh, is uh, actually uh, on Wikipedia. Now, I don't know what you think about Wikipedia, but... <laughs> I was giving, uh, when I was chancellor at SUNY, a state of the state address, state of the university address. I always called it the state of the state. Of course, that was wrong. And there were, it wasn't standing room only, but every year I would toddle up to the microphone and try to tell people what we were doing at the State University of New York. And I think uh, I had been saying a lot about the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I had a lot of students working with me, and one of them invented the word systemness. And somebody in the audience put it on Wikipedia. And so we said, well, what the heck? We will, I'm sure Webster would approve of this. And um, I guess you could understand why I was so blown away with systemness. This is where I started teaching. This is a one-room school in the foothills of the Ozarks. And when I left, they closed all the one-room schools. Well, I must have done something wrong. But can you imagine a girl from southern Ohio, well, a county fair queen, actually. Um, <laughs> my uh, mother overheard this woman say, the ugliest one always gets it. So I. That was training for being university president, by the way. So these are the 64, <laughs> these are the 64 campuses of the state university system. And uh, I actually uh, came in on June 1, and they always ask new presidents, so what are you going to do first? And I said naively, I'm going to visit the campuses. At the University of Cincinnati, this is a golf cart and two days. I left home on June the 2nd starting with Cornell. Did you know that was part of the State University of New York? And I traveled to the 64 campuses. I came home Labor Day. But it was the best thing I could ever have done because it showed me the power of uh, the economic engine that is our university systems. In most of the communities, a university is the largest employer. Uh, they drive economic development. They work uh, with uh, business and industry. So. This systemness thing was my first experience with trying to work well together at the higher education level. So I did what many would do in a new situation like that. I held conferences and discussions and had lots of stakeholders at the table until we reached a decision of how we could be the economic recovery engine for New York. I came in 2008, I was so busy, I didn't know we were having a recession. But it turns out we were, and universities had to play a role in that recovery. So we thought we needed to play a role in healthcare and in energy and in global affairs. Uh, and most importantly, uh, and I say it is my personal favorite, in what we were calling the education pipeline. I will tell you unequivocally, that word was not being used. Nobody really thought about education all the way back to birth or prenatal care, which is a lot more fashionable these days than then, and didn't think about seeing life on that kind of continuum. So I made no bones as chancellor that the education pipeline was a pretty big thing with me, and we were going to use our ability to incentivize collective behavior around that cradle-to-career pipeline to move the dial in education for New York. 
And somewhere along the line, I, uh, to the reverend, where are you, Kenneth? This is my scripture. I, I just want to say I carry this quote from David Leonhardt everywhere I go. Education, educating more people, is simply the best bet any society can make. And you know the routine. It solves health care issues. It gives people a livelihood. Their children are healthier. Their children are educated. They're better citizens. They vote more often. It's just unequivocal. The people who say we don't need more education just don't get it. I don't know what else to say. So we turned this educating more people into remembering that access is our first opportunity. And frankly, for many, we got stuck on access. We forgot to think about completion. So let everybody in, but don't worry about whether they get out. That is not going to work in our economy. And then success is, Mr. Workforce Development, success is a career, a job, a livelihood. So this became the standard for that great big university system. So if completion is really the composite of access and completion, and career success, how are we as a country doing? Well, this completion puzzle does not speak too well for our progress. Yes, we've landed on a six-year graduation rate from college at about 60%. And uh, I think, by the way, I even hesitate to use the community college data because we really don't know how many community college students are successful. 40% of the State University of New York graduates from our baccalaureate institutions started at a community college. So how can we say that 13% or 22% or 28% when we don't even know how to track the success of our community colleges? The whole point of this is we're not doing all that well. And if you disaggregate the data and you look at who's completing and who's achieving, we're not doing that well there either. And by the way, I will say a number of times, disaggregating the data is absolutely necess necessary. We can't tell how we're doing. We can't, can't close the achievement gaps if we're not disaggregating the data. But something else I do live with, and I, I said to Pat I might say this, so I'm going to say it. Um, we have a big divide here about who's at fault when an institution like SUNY offers remediation for over 40% of the students who come to us. And we're pretty big on saying, if you, if you're K-12, are you? If you would send us better students, we would do a better job. But turns out, we prepare the teachers who teach the students who come to college ready or not. And uh, with a bodyguard, I have said that many times to my higher ed colleagues. So you remember in about 2008, this was something Lumina was interested in. This was something, Jim, that Gates was interested in. It was something you encouraged other philanthropic organizations to get involved in. We began to set these targets. It's a little confusing because <clears throat> if the six-year baccalaureate graduation rate is about 60%, and then the foundations are talking about 60% of the adults having some post-secondary experience and completion, and then this guy, you know, it's really funny what I'm doing with this. That guy uh, wanted a 65% goal as well. It really doesn't matter whether it's 60% of the adults in your state or 60% of the students going to college or 60% of underfunded uh, and impoverished students. All these people, all these networks, and of course, Advance Illinois, and all the networks that are here, of which there are many, and I met some of you tonight, began to pick up the gauntlet on completion. And um, you remember George Bush number 41 talked about a thousand points of light? We have to congratulate him. We have created 10,000 points of light. We have created a lot of initiatives, many of whom, by the way, I counted 12 of these groups that SUNY belonged to. So we were joining uh, 
uh, improvement networks that are listed up here, and this is only about half or less of the, of the ones that are really in business trying to move that dial. So to Luminous credit, Jim, took a real hard look at our progress, and from 2008 to uh, initially 2014, 15, at that point we had moved the dial 2%. Now, rightly so, Lumina began to count credentials. I think that's fair enough. I think that answers the argument that college is not for everybody because credentials, somebody said to me once, if you, if you leave college with some student debt and you don't get that degree, that's like having a mortgage without a house. You have, you have nothing to put on the wall. This is not going to move the economy if we don't find ways to credential prior learning experience, work experience, and then the traditional degrees of two-year and four-year institutions. Once you throw in credentials in the count, we've moved the dial since 2008, 10 years ago, eight percentage points. Nothing to write home about. And the projection, again, with an organization with great credibility, uh, even though we're projecting a 2020 target, it might be reached by 2037. I love this. If you had a 2025 goal, because Lumina had one deadline and the president had another deadline and other institutions, you would uh, realize your goal in 2054. In other words, we need to speed up the work. We need to face the reality that we're not getting it done, and no matter how you cut it, if 60% is our goal, which I think is laudable, 40% are not reaching that goal. So the, the real message is that we have to get better. We just simply have to get better, and it's not about the target. It's about learning how to get better. So in this confusing milieu, there are solutions and systems or cobbled together systems or wobbly systems are a big part of the answer. And I have to say, I don't really think we have a system of education in America. I think we have multiple systems. And when you look at the way regulations work at the federal level, ESSA is a K-12, PK-12 benchmark. That's not where higher ed gets regulated. We get regulated in the Higher Education Act, which I think is, what, Jim, eight years and it still hasn't passed? And early childhood is regulated in about four different agencies, in HHS, in labor, in defense. Is there any wonder that we don't think system at the federal level or at the state level? Well, okay, here's another. This isn't quite my text, Reverend. But it was pretty powerful when The World is Flat came out. And this guy said, you know what? If only we could get our act together in post-secondary as well as in our intellectual and innovative practices, nobody could touch us. But we're pretty siloed. We're pretty independent. We don't like to play well in the sandbox. We want to do it our way. And we have got to get over that. So my illustration is a personal one. When I arrived at the University of Cincinnati in, oh, by the way, Cincinnati, uh, so they kind of named themselves after their cities, this was the data. Now, this is New York data because I could get the most update. We don't think about high school graduation earlier than, say, juniors to seniors, because I don't know how else we would have an 85% graduation rate in this country if we started counting from ninth grade. Because ninth graders are going to drop out before they even get to the high school diploma, about 25% of them. And before they get from that high school commencement to the first day of classes, 51 of those 100 ninth graders are still standing. And we spend a lot of time thinking about freshman to sophomore retention, 38. The bottom line, when I arrived in Cincinnati and today in New York, one in five of those ninth graders will make it through a six-year 
baccalaureate completion experience. One in five. And you can bet when you disaggregate the data, we can figure out where they live. Oh my God, what are we going to do? This is the most fabulous cartoon. It's from Albuquerque, the Albuquerque Journal, because Albuquerque has a cradle to career partnership and it started just like this. If you would send us better students, we would do a better job. And you know, in the days of No Child Left Behind, the only people in the barrel were PK-12. We weren't in the barrel, higher ed. Social agencies weren't in the barrel. One irresponsible entity was taking all the heat. And Race to the Top got a little better. And I believe if we'd had more time, we actually had President Obama talking about the pipeline. He actually, it's like Groucho Marx, who's as old as I am, and the duck comes down. I mean, it's the pipeline, stupid. We have got to get our act together and we have to start earlier. I do often accuse my colleagues in higher education of starting at grade 13. Starting at grade 13, you got a lot of remediation, you got a lot of trouble. We, in Ohio, when they got mad about remediation in the legislature, they said, we are paying twice and that's not going to work. So in Cincinnati, this was us and we couldn't quite figure out how to get our act together. So we sent some academics and some students to a pub. What doesn't happen in a pub? I go around looking for these napkins that have drawings on them because there could be something really valuable there. This turned out to be a pretty famous roadmap for what we need to do. Get kids ready for kindergarten, reading at third grade level, doing their math at eighth grade level, graduating high school, getting into college, staying into college, getting a degree, and joining the workforce. And in every case, there had to be a metric. I know we've talked a little bit, uh, John, about measuring and testing, and I'm not going there. But I will say to you, if we don't have a metric, we're never going to mm -hmm. know. We are never going to know. In Cincinnati, in Northern Kentucky, every school district had a different instrument for kindergarten readiness, but at least they had one. So we didn't try to aggregate it. We let you have your measure that worked for your school district or whatever, let you, the measure that worked for your university. And we went from there to this, and that's why I didn't want to give up on that first slide. I know everybody on that slide, and I will tell you, it probably mimics the 60 by 25, the uh, Strive Together initiatives that are in Chicago and Oak Park, because you've got to have everybody. There were a lot of universities there, there were superintendents there, there were union leaders, there were business community leaders, mayors. I am there, but the guy got in front of me. <laughs> and I was one of the co-founders. When I look at this picture, I just want to say, Arrow, she's there, she's there. But you see what? You have to turn over ownership. You can't say, I was there. You have to say, we were there. And this, folks, is 10 years ago. Go slow to go fast. 10 years ago, all we knew is that we needed that roadmap, we needed to get those kids through that pipeline, and we had no idea what to do next. Now. Over time, we figured out what to do, and the only reason I wanted to put this up is a couple of dudes who wrote in the Stanford Innovation Review in 2011 started touring the country looking for communities that had moved the dial. They found a, a group in Virginia that was cleaning up a river. They found a group in Massachusetts that was lowering obesity. Uh, they didn't include this one, but there were rave reviews about Milwaukee lowering teenage pregnancies. And of course, they found Strive Together, that little pipeline up there. And they stayed with us a long time until they wrote up what they found across the country in a highly reputable journal with Stanford in its title. And they decided that what we have here is collective impact. So, out goes systemness, it is still on the Wikipedia, but I didn't write it up in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, so now we're talking collective impact. But you know what? It's fine. 
I only want to caution you that there are a lot of imposters out there. I also say about my colleagues, when they ask you as a university president, are you doing blah, 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 you go, oh yeah, we do that. Oh yeah, we've done that. We always do that. And I've taken to saying, no, you aren't. Because collective impact takes so much sweat equity and depersonalization and humility that the way they describe it is pretty impressive to me. And actually, in Cincinnati and in these Strive Together networks across the country, of which there are about 70, the arrows are moving up. And you know what sold the day for us? We quit talking about achievement and assessment and benchmarks, and we talk about trending positive. Can you see the dial moving, trending positive? And we reward trending positive. Our proof points in Strive Together, which is what Cincinnati became when it went global after that collective impact article, we are happy if the indicators below the goal of kindergarten readiness are trending positive. So uh, I could show you a hundred of these, but this is Portland moving the FAFSA completion dial. Will you tell me why we can't get the FAFSA form completed? I mean, I know it's hard, but a lot of things are hard. Uh, this is summer mouth. This is 50% of the kids that say they're going to go to college in June and don't arrive there in September. Fancy uh, intellectual academic term called summer melt. But you know what? We ought to be able to fix that. And uh, the, what this article, this Stanford article said about collective impact is that it essentially has four ingredients. And um, instead of this boring pillar thing, one of the key ingredients of collective impact is the table. You have got to figure out who has enough leadership gizmo to get the right people at the table. And I will tell you, the first time we went shopping for the superintendents, in